I think crying is one of the most powerful medicines. And we want men to cry. We want boys to cry. Of course, people are going to, don't cry for stupid stuff. Okay, uh, your girlfriend said this to you, you're hurt, you're going to cry in front of her. No, but you can go into your own space and cry your heart out because I can guarantee you one thing. After you cry, the feeling that you have is not good. It's empowering. There is nothing wrong. Crying is therapeutic. There is science in it. I get my cancer patients to cry all the time. I say, please cry. Because a lot of people say, laugh, 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 positive, think positive. Think positive is the worst advice. And a lot of our patients who have had miscarriages, there are many, many, many uses, uh, uh, causes of a miscarriage. But you know the one that comes out more prominently now and ask every patient who's gone through, at any point, did you reject this child in your mind? And in most cases of miscarriages, most, not all, the mother was, yes, I never wanted to have the child, but my husband or my in-laws or my whatever. You as the mother, the source of holding a child has rejected it at a subconscious level. Your body will make sure you don't have the child. I'm a proud Indian citizen. I've spoken about my own past very often on this podcast. I've had an ayahuasca experience myself. Ayahuasca, psychedelic, psilocybin. These aren't drugs. Of course, they're used for recreation all over the world. But these are not substances that you should get into. These are not substances you should use for fun. The world of neuroscience, the world of neurology studies these substances to understand science better, to understand therapy better, to understand our world better. We've shared our own ayahuasca experiences, our own psilocybin experiences on this particular episode. The intention is to not encourage any viewer, any listener to consume drugs. Drug addiction of any form will harm you. Any addiction of any form will harm you. But you know what? The society that we all have grown up in, it's not the way that human beings are meant to live. And that's why we see so many mental health issues so rampant in modern times, whether you're an Indian listener, whether you're a listener from outside our country. This is a conversation on shrooms, on the worldwide mental health pandemic, and on one of my favorite subjects, parental issues, daddy issues, mommy issues. We spoke about mental strength. We spoke about the concept of the dark night of the soul with one of India's most respected health professionals, Luke Coutinho. This episode is very close to my heart and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed creating it. PRS is a Spotify exclusive. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. This podcast is all about letting our heart out. It's myself, that's my guest. Open, free-flowing conversations just like this. One of the heaviest, most emotional episodes that we've ever created. It's with the legend himself. Luke Coutinho. Luke Coutinho, welcome back to a new age version of TRS. The All Star is back. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? I'm great. I have so much to say about uh, my recent experiences, which I would only share on a episode with you. <laughs> but I actually want to get to know <clears throat> about your reality first. This is me not speaking to you as a professional, but just mm -hmm. as a person. Right. What's yeah. been up? Because uh, <clears throat> I've realized that men, especially in our country, evolve a lot through the course of their 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. Some evolve sometimes in a negative direction. And right. what I mean by that is some move towards more mental health issues. Right. I notice that a lot in Bollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you generally? Let's begin there. I'm in a fantastic space. Fantastic space. Today, I don't know how tomorrow will be, but today I'm in a fantastic space. Because I've learned to see life, that every moment can be different. But right now, rather than labeling my life because I have five bad things happening, that my phase right now is bad. It's amazing. I think the last couple of months have been amazing. Doesn't mean there's, there, there have been no struggles and stuff, but it's been amazing because I feel amazing. I like mm. to go with how I feel, mm. not with what's happening. So it's been amazing. But like I said, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And whatever happens tomorrow, it's a phase. Do you ever have lows? I can't imagine. Absolutely. Doing... Absolutely. I, I would have had three lows or four lows this morning itself because I had two very difficult cancer patients in the morning and I have one terminally ill right now. Who I'm thinking about, 
But there are so many highs also happening, and I choose to focus on the highs because the lows are out of control. Mm. They're completely out of control. It can make me feel bad, but it cannot dictate how I'm going to feel in the next hour. I think that's the gift of the process of aging. You just learn to let go of the <laughs> overthinking before it becomes something big in your head. Overthinking, but I'll tell you what's worked for me because I've been reflecting on why am I in such a good space the last couple of you know months. It's because I've learned to stop resisting. What I'm choosing the path of non-resistance. Anything. You see, nature is most people don't have stress in their life. I know, I know this is going to be funny because everyone's saying we have stress in our life, but most people don't. They only have circumstances, events, and people that they're resisting. That is their stress. Most people don't have stress. It is something or someone that they are resisting that is now causing their suffering, which is their stress. Mm. So by removing away from, because resistance is not solving a problem, it's only depleting energy. And that's what I've learned. It's a simple example. We have a wall in front of us, okay? And now you and I are gonna try to push that wall down. Okay, it's resistance. It's because it's a strong wall. You and I are pushing, we're depleting energy, getting frustrated. It's a law of nature, the, the wall is strong. Okay, when do I stop pushing it and say that if I need to get to the other side, okay, one way is breaking down the wall, the other way is going around, above, or maybe I don't wanna to get to the other side. It's not mm. important. Mm. It's not my why. So I've dropped resistance. Doesn't mean I'm not ambitious, doesn't mean I'm not gonna try hard, but I've dropped resistance on things that I cannot control, people mm. that I cannot control. Doesn't make you a doormat. Mm. So the resistance, I believe, has bought me inner peace over the last couple of months and I am enjoying it. What is the process of aging for a man? Like, what do you notice about your own body? And you're someone who's really taken care of yourself. No, but I've never felt I've aged till now. I know I'm gonna age. I don't feel, I don't feel, I believe age is a number. I think it's perception again. I've never looked at, oh, I'm gonna celebrate my 30s and my 40s and stuff like that. Never, never. Because it's a number, what's there to celebrate mm. in it? Mm. So till date, I know my body's gonna change. I know, that's why I work harder at preserving it. I will die, I will get old, I will lose muscle mass, I will have more gray hair, I may lose hair. I'm okay with it. I made my peace with it. Because I know the quickest way to age is through stress. Mm. The quickest. Mm. And no amount of cosmetics, metformin can stop that at all. So because I'm privileged to speak to patients and learn from their mistakes, that's why I can follow that mm. particular part. So I don't believe it. I, I can do most things that maybe a 20 year could do. Mm. I'm not very flexible because I didn't take care of flexibility earlier, but now I'm learning that while I'm improving my yoga practice, my body can still change at the age of 40, 41, 42. I can still get flexible and that's the beauty of the human body. Mm. So I'm not gonna let age come as a number and say this, People will say, oh, your sex drive will start decreasing at 35, 40, 45, 50. I have clients at, in the age group of 65 and 70 who are probably having more sex than people on Tinder. Mm. <laughs> Libido and all of that. And that's the beauty. So you see social media, they, oh, age, your sex drive will decrease. No, if you believe that, it's going to happen. But if you maintain your testosterone levels the right way mm. and you're exercising and you believe that sex is not about impression and how much of vigor, but it's so much more than you know everything else. You can have a great sex life when you're 65 and 70. I'm not 65 and 70, but I have loads of people who are having en enviable sex lives, <laughs> literally, wow. men and women. Mm. So age is just a number, but because we age, we respect our body more because we know from the time we're born, we've started dying. Yeah. So with that respect for the body, I probably make better lifestyle decisions. Yeah. Uh, you know, turning this whole anti-stress conversation into something actionable, mm -hmm. genuinely one of the best mental health exercises that I did for myself <clears throat> in my recent past was taking up yoga classes, like just understanding the ABCs of it right? Uh, and understanding how stress is also stored in the body, mm -hmm. but also understanding the power of your own bones and what's inside. And I, this is something I feel people aren't aware of. I actually think you told me about this the last time we were recording off camera, mm -hmm. something about the bone marrow and the powers that it holds oh, yeah. for your mind as yeah. well as the recovery of your body. Absolutely. So you want to shed some light on that? Sure, your bones. So, so let me break down. So I do integrative medicine. Integrative mm. medicine in oncology is very important when it comes to your bone marrow. Mm. Because when we talk about immunity, immunity has been thrown around because of the pandemic. Some people think immunity is more gilloy, more turmeric, more garlic. It's far from that. Your bones. Your bone marrow produces something called stem cells. You have the right number of stem cells and quality of stem cells. You have a fantastic immune system. Doesn't mean you won't fall sick. You can fall sick 
but your recovery will be a breeze. Mm. Like we've seen two populations, people who get COVID and suffer miserably and take months to heal. And you see people who get COVID, 24 hours later, they're back asymptomatic, everything's fine. What's the difference? The immune system. Mm. Nothing else, mitochondrial dysfunction. So stem cells is everything. And that's why stem cell treatments today, bone marrow transplants is your ultimate when it comes to certain cancers. If you can get the bone to produce stem cells, your body's intelligence heals you. How do you trigger it? Is it through stretching? So many beautiful things. Okay. Stretching, food, sleep, mm. again. So when you look at burn victims, there's a grade, burn grades, one, two, three, four. Mm. So one, treatable, two, treatable, three, it's scarred the bones. Mm. They're probably between a three and four, they're gonna put you in a unit where it's completely sealed, not even dust can get in because you have no immune system. Your bone's damaged, you can't produce stem cells. You're literally without an immune system, which means most of those bone burn patients will die of infection not because of the burn. My God. So that is the importance of bone, of bone steps. Now, when we look at bone, again, building muscle, better bone health. Less preservatives, better bone health. It's not about calcium. That's the biggest myth. More calcium means better bones. Mm. We need calcium, K2, magnesium, and D3 in a matrix for better bones. Walking, one of the best exercises for bone health. Yeah. Yoga. Yeah, that's what I- All of this. You know, a lot of these uh, yoga practitioners that I meet often have radiant skin, mm -hmm. look way younger than they are. Uh, great hair, and I'd, I'd put you in that same bracket. <laughs> Thank uh, you. you know, like when you meet certain people, they glow mm -hmm. uh, even more in person. Like the camera sometimes doesn't catch the glow correctly, but sometimes you just meet someone and there's so much peace on their face. And it's often because of some high level of yoga or a bunch of lifestyle factors that they're doing, right. uh, you know, together. But specifically when we're talking about yoga, what I've understood is that your bones are not brittle. That's mm -hmm. what people think bones are. People think right. bones are like, <clears throat> you know, something hard. It's not glass, right. but it's something you can't bend. Bones are actually meant to bend slightly. Yeah, there's a slight flexibility in there. Mm. And that's what yoga brings back. It yeah. brings flexibility of your muscles, like of your connective tissue, but also your bones. And that's why yoga also, true yoga will also allow your asana not to look Instagram perfect. Can you explain this? Yeah. So. If you look on Instagram, mm. every asana is perfect. So it makes people think yoga is difficult. Mm. But a real yoga teacher, even if I'm unable to do that asana, it doesn't look right, but I'm moving into that. I'm stimulating my bones, mm. my cartilages. My, it's about getting into the pose. It's not about reaching that perfect pose. There are many people who will never reach that perfect pose, but because they're doing it consistently, it's working for them. Mm. So uh, again, people think yoga has to be that perfect instinct. They wait. You know, most people putting up their poses have probably clicked 10, 15, 20 pictures. You should be so proud to put up the first picture of your asana, mm. no matter how funny it looks, and send a message to the world that I'm in the journey of maybe reaching there. But mm. this is the real me. Mm. It's, you know, that's how it is. Yeah. Um, do you think like this great skin and hair that we see with like people like yourself or yoga practitioners, is it down to your bones producing more stem cells, which actually go and heal pimples faster, take away <clears throat> uh, pigmentation of your skin faster? It can play a very small role, but there's a lot more. It's also see, food. It's, it, it's also, I, I know a lot of people who eat junk food, don't have the best lifestyles, but yet they glow. Mm. So while I would like to say that, yes, nutrition is everything and stuff. See, think of it as you and I, we have a candle inside everyone. It's your spirit. When your spirit is nurtured, you are going to glow irrespective. Even someone who's darker skinned, you will see a glow in them. It's that inner candle, which is your spirit. When the mm. spirit is clouded, like you may say I'm glowing right now, but if I start to think negative thoughts and bad thoughts and bad intentions, the glow, you will see the glow disappear in front of you. I'm diminishing my own spirit. Yeah. So it's not always food and bone. It plays a huge role. Mm. Because again, more stem cells, lesser inflammation. What's the fastest thing that ages people? Inflammation, mm. chronic inflammation. So the, the, the more trained my immune system to switch off inflammation, the younger you are gonna be. Mm. You're not gonna reverse aging, but you're gonna slow it down. And most people today are, are aging way before their age, mm. way before. So now I can sit and meditate for four hours in a day. It doesn't mean I'm gonna slow down aging. I have to meditate, but I also have to take the essence of my meditation. I, it can't just be good thoughts and clarity in that one hour of meditation. Mm. How do I move it into my day? Mm. How do I move it into a life situation, into a relationship? Yeah. And that's what keeps the spirit 
alive. I think this hardware and software when it comes to this topic and the last episode was about the hardware. Mm-hmm. Maybe this one's a little bit more about the software. The hardware is all your lifestyle factors, your right. habits, yeah. your choice in food. Software is down to so many other things. It's down to your childhood experiences. It's down Absolutely. to your partner. It's down to your career choices. Software is governed by so much. Which is why I want to highlight a couple of Netflix documentaries. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you why I'm highlighting this. We've created an episode on ayahuasca and yeah. mm-hmm. uh, the world of neurology and how it's studying these substances. Correct. Um, these are not recreational drugs. Though they are listed as class one uh, mm-hmm. drugs. What's the word? Right. Class A's and class different A. classes. Yeah. Which, which puts them in the same category as heroin, cocaine. Correct. These are not addictive. These are not used for recreation. Mm-hmm. If done correctly and administered through trained professionals mm-hmm. uh, from a spiritual perspective also, they can be immensely beneficial for your software. Absolutely. It's all the things we were crying about now. Yeah. Things out of our control. When you started dating that person, you didn't know that that person will cause these kind of problems in your life. Boom, right. they did. What do you do now? Your software is a little yeah. muddy. Um, when you were taking up this career, you didn't know that it'll be this challenging. Boom, your software is muddy. Mm-hmm. But Western doctors, <clears throat> and I'm what I mean is American neurologists, European neurologists, neuroscientists all over the world are studying these substances psilocybin, mescaline, yeah. uh, DMT mm-hmm. uh, to kind of help us with the software problems that we see all over the world. Right. Uh, the two documentaries I've seen on Netflix, which really kind of opened up my eyes. One was called Fantastic Fungi or Fungi, yeah, however you want to say. That. Yeah. Which is mm-hmm. about mushrooms, mushrooms and mycelium. And it's an incredible documentary. The second one is, um, I think it's a new one. It's called How to Change Your Mind. And okay. each episode, one's about psilocybin, one's about mescaline, mm-hmm. uh, or one's about something else. One's about, I think, just LSD. Have you seen Fantastic Fungi? I think that's a I've great I've seen that one. I've not seen the second one. Okay. Although a lot of my clients now, I know they've been sending me the last couple of days. I think it's new. Yeah. That, hey, listen, can we do this? Can we do this? Yeah. I think it's how to change your mind. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you want to tell people as a health professional mm-hmm. about fungi and why lots of neurologists believe that uh, psychedelic mushrooms are going to be a very big deal in the world of neuroscience, in the world of mental health. Right. Even psychologists all over the world are starting to learn more about these subjects. Mm-hmm. Uh, why don't you kind of just transfer the data from fantastic fungi to TRS mm-hmm. through Luke Coutinho? So it's very simple. We have to be open to everything. If we're open to pharmaceuticals pumping people with chemicals with massive side effects, we're open to that. Okay, we have to also open, be open to an alternative. When I say an alternative, it doesn't mean that I'm saying stop taking your drugs and rely on a mushroom to cure you. Mm. Integrated, but be open to the fact that it's not being studied right now. It was being studied from World War II. Mm. Scientists in LA were studying and there are experiments done on World War II soldiers on the usage of LSD. They just found that while it had so many benefits, it wasn't ideal for a soldier because reflexes were being delayed and the soldier could get killed because you need reflexes. It's being studied for the longest time and I think the world today has to be open to it. Again, it's perception of a young kid or even a young adult, okay, today who says that, oh, wow, I'm going to trip, I'm going to be happy, I'm going to, wrong perception. But when you look at what it can do at a mental, emotional state and even a spiritual space, it can fire neurons that you would never fire in any stage of your life. Mm. The brain is so diverse. Mm. Your neural pathways, signaling pathways are so diverse. Mushrooms today, we use mushrooms in all of our diets, different types, because it's been scientifically studied as one of the most powerful foods. So while you have normal mushrooms, again, psilocybin. Now we can call psilocybin a psychedelic. Okay, I call it a medicine. While the effect is psychedelic, it doesn't make it just a psychedelic because then you classify it into the whole category of drugs and stuff like that. My point is, today, people don't want to be chronically sick anymore. Mm. The world is chronically sick. People are living till 80 and 90, and we call it as advancement in technology, but we've not been able to reduce suffering or get people to get better. This is where psychedelics are going to come in at some point, Mm. especially when diseases today, 90% of them are caused by emotional issues. Poor childhoods cause poor thought processes, wrong behaviors, lifestyle diseases. Now, we can't go back into that childhood and change anything. But if we open up new ways of seeing the problem, because the point is, if you know people who have done ayahuasca, LSD, they see life very differently. Mm. I'm not talking about the wannabe crowd. I'm talking about the people who are deeply into it, not overusing it, 
using it with the right intention. They see life differently. They see a problem differently. They see relationships differently. Why? How, is, how can you see something differently? Your brain. Mm. So new solutions come up, new problems come up. They can be very calm. They don't see a common relationship problem as a re relationship problem. They just see it as an up or a down, different perception. The problem's the same. Mm. So neuroscientists today are realizing the power of the mind. So anything that can empower the mind is now going to become medicine. Okay. So whether it's mushrooms, whether it's LSD, and again, when we talk about this, it's not to give permission to the audience to misuse it mm. because there are a lot of people not even getting the right quality. Yeah. They don't even know. They don't even know. Very few people know that a good LSD trip can last for 14 to 18 hours. Today, with the street LSD that you get, people are two hours and then they want a candy flip, they want a parachute, they want MDMA because it's not given them, because they've gone in it with the wrong intention. Mm. But there's a whole population. It's like ayahuasca. Today, you have people bringing ayahuasca to Karjat and trying to, you, you, you don't do it. You go to the Amazon, you do it under the guidance of a spiritual shaman who will give you logic, science, and will change the way you see life when you're ready for it. But let me tell you something. Everyone who's ever taken a pharmaceutical drug, if you break down every ingredient, Okay, it'll actually make a lot of the drugs that you mm. look at so negatively, you'll realize that what you're taking is far worse, mm. far worse. Mm. It's not a comparison. I'm not saying drugs are better than that. Of course, they're addictive in nature and that's why they're bad and you shouldn't do it. But the point is when you really get to learn what these chemicals and most of your pharmaceutical drugs are doing for you, Okay, it'll change your perception to everything around you. But you don't know and it's best that you don't know. Okay. That's how it is. You know, I think human minds understand stories. So mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of share a couple of stories here. The origins of both ayahuasca and magic mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, ayahuasca is a combination of two plants in the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon rainforest is home to more than millions of species of plants. How do you figure that when you combine these two, you get this exactly. blue? So yeah. no one knows how people figured out what ayahuasca is. Yeah. Uh, ayahuasca is a drink mm -hmm. that you do in spiritual circumstances, ideally with a shaman. Uh, when you drink it, they make you lie down. Mm -hmm. It kicks in 15, 20 minutes later. And the ayahuasca kind of takes you through your own mind. Mm -hmm. Someone had quantified meditation as being at different levels. And they say that these substances push you to the eighth level of meditation. Mm -hmm. Meditation has even more levels than this, but True. pushes you to a very high meditative state. And what that means from a biological level is probably new neural uh, pathways are opened up mm -hmm. in that state of mind. You know how right. you feel after a great meditation, you open your eyes, colors yeah. are more saturated. What's happening? Mm -hmm. The brain has switched into some other gear. Correct. Now this is a substance that without the meditation, it just makes you jump there. So you understand, oh, my mind is also capable of feeling this, this yeah. reality. And seeing. And seeing yeah. things, yeah. Uh, probably you, you see some new color. Mm -hmm. you, you're you like, oh, I can't even like <clears throat> describe what this is. I don't know. How do you describe a new color? Yeah. You know, like it's a color beyond what we know on the mm -hmm. rainbow spectrum. Coming back to what ayahuasca does, um, you always have to write down what you want from a therapeutic trip. So you take a piece of paper and you say, okay, I need these things from this experience. You can't just do it for fun. That's how the shamanic... Uh, people in South America have used it for more than what they believe to be 50,000 years, which is when humans were still hunter gatherers. Someone figured that, yes, when you combine these two substances, you get this portion, which can be used for therapeutic purposes. Yeah. And there's historians like Graham Hancock who attribute uh, that revolution of consciousness where I believe that's when humans roughly started farming, like tools got much better okay. suddenly. Right. So they attribute it to these substances. Mm, that's the story of ayahuasca. Okay. Only recently it's being discovered by the world of neuroscience and neurology. Yeah. <clears throat> so you see all these documentaries and so many people talking about it. Uh, and these are not recommendations. We're just sharing yeah. knowledge here. Uh, if you want to do ayahuasca, you have to go to the Amazon. You have to do your own research. Uh, I'm sure it's illegal in most countries all over the world. Mm -hmm. But it's not for recreation. The second story I really have to highlight is what I kind of learned in Fantastic Fungi. Mm -hmm. through, and Paul Stamets doing his podcast with Joe Rogan. Fungus is a very important part of our earth. Mm -hmm. Mushroom is a type of fungus. There's something called a mycelium net. And please correct me. And a communication network, yes. basically. Yeah. So basically say there's a mango tree, which mm -hmm. is a very powerful mango tree. And uh, it produces a mango, which has a seed inside the gutli. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, one of the mangoes falls down. An animal kind of uh, half eats it. 
and drops it a little bit far away say 2 mm. kilometers away right now here we have this powerful mother tree okay but the animals dropped that seed from the mother tree 2 kilometers away mm-hmm. over 10 years a new mango tree grows mm-hmm. now this new mango tree is the child of the old mother, the mother tree, tree yeah. but they are connected they are mother and child i think botanists have done this is what was in fantastic fungi botanists have performed experiments where they found out that mother trees still supply their children which are kilometers away from themselves mm-hmm. through not their network of roots but through an underground network of fungi right. called the mycelium net correct so it's like a nervous system all over the earth's crust so very likely the earth's crust a part of the earth's crust that's in india is very much connected to a part of the earth's crust in france absolutely through the mycelium net it's mm-hmm. just how the nature of the earth's crust is what's weird is that we have also evolved from fungi we think our earliest ancestors the monkey mm-hmm. that's the image we have no 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 you evolved from a singular wow. cell organism mm-hmm. but somewhere along the evolution of that singular cell organism it became a mushroom and it stayed there its cousin turned into an animal turned into an insect which is what we evolved from so a mushroom is an ancient ancestor of us we are fungus inside our body as well mm-hmm. we're in touch with the earth right now if you walk on grass without slippers correct yeah you're also connected to the mycelium net yeah. the fungus in your body is connected with the fungus inside the earth now what i'd like to highlight is that we often think that as human beings we're the most intelligent beings on earth what about orcas mm-hmm. killer whales who have their own culture correct yeah what about elephants if anyone uh, has spent time in national parks or spoken to zoologists people keep talking about the intelligence that elephants have mm-hmm. just scientific discovery is not the complete gauge for intelligence mm-hmm. mushrooms also according to fantastic fungi have their own intelligence and they've been there even before the dinosaurs so they saw the dinosaurs and survived because the nature of a mushroom and the nature of fungus is such that it can survive in the worst possible conditions yeah. even when cockroaches die mushrooms will survive mm-hmm. now here's an organism that's been <clears throat> existing on earth and evolving by itself while we've gone on down our own path of evolution Why do we say we're more evolved than this organism if it's older? If it could take over a whole planet through the crust, maybe when we die through asteroids or tsunamis, the fungus will still be alive. Mm-hmm. Now, who's more evolved here? Yeah. So, fantastic fungi claims that there are certain psychedelic mushrooms. Again, you consume it just like you'd consume ayahuasca, but when you consume it, you're taking in a bit of that intelligence right. inside your body and of course you're not supposed to use it for recreation Absolutely. as most people do most people have this recreational yeah. perspective on mushroom and then you've got someone like paul stamets joe rogan these people who talk about the therapeutic uses of psychedelic mushrooms right. that when you eat it you're actually tapping into a much higher much more ancient intelligence that mother mango tree is finding its way to you right do you look at it in a similar way absolutely so it comes down to you made some fantastic points which i want to bring out okay sure because uh the thing is it's not about who's smarter man or nature we have to coexist mm. because we're interdependent on each other you take nature out of a person's life we do not we'll survive because the body's resilient but we can never thrive mm. we begin we begin to decompose and die immediately immediately you know the whole point is coexistence number 2 it's energy so why when you walk on mud or you walk on grass you feel energetic there are energy exchanges happening even between people even between people there is energy exchange happening with all of us right now because our biorhythms are interdependent and interconnected in this room right now that's why if i say something there can be four different perceptions in this room and four different emotions because of four different perceptions so we are and therapeutically we have to always understand if we can feel it <clears throat> if it's doing something good for us is because we have the receptors cannabis how does it make you high because you have an opiate receptor if you didn't have an opiate receptor you couldn't get high we are producing opiates in our brain without cannabis we are producing steroids like i said we're producing a pharmacy of drugs in our body when pharmaceuticals didn't exist <clears throat> so when pharmaceuticals didn't exist the shamans all of them they found that nature can have these effects if it worked then just because science says oh it's not documented there's no evidence the point is who's studying it mm. who's funding studies for these things no one that's why you have to have people who go and make these documentaries dedicate a life to show us a show as great and scientific as this one 
Because no one's interested. There's no money to be made. There's no money to be made in that. Who's taking meditation as a subject and really blowing it out with all the science that already exists? No one, because there's no money to be made from it. In fact, a lot of people will lose money. If we become calmer people, if we become happier people, we don't need so much that is money and business to other people. So absolutely psychedelics use the right dosage, the right quality, the right time for the right people, even for the right people. So an assessment of a shaman, he will also tell you whether you are right for this or it's too early for you. Mm. He will tell you that. Mm. It is so important for us to understand the connection of therapeutics in us. So we can't judge it. Mm. We can't just say, if science says this, I'll do this. We have to go into depth because science has also made us believe things which are not right. Yeah. So what I wanted to tell you was that I've had a mushroom experience in my past. Okay. Um, I've also had an ayahuasca experience which I've spoken about on the show. And it's been a podcast that's <clears> helped a lot of people, a lot of CEOs, mm -hmm. army folks, um, entrepreneurs come up to me and speak about specifically that episode. Mm -hmm. While I was making it, I didn't realize what I was putting out there, but it's helped a lot of people. And it's kind of opened up people's eyes to ayahuasca. But mushrooms are a completely different, different yeah. uh, trip. Again, this requires its own solo episode, but I'll tell you in short. So in ayahuasca, you feel the presence of a mother, which is supposed mm -hmm. to heal you, but you feel a very strong switch in personality right after you do it. Mushrooms are not the same. Mm -hmm. And to understand what a mushroom can do to you therapeutically, Try understanding what a mushroom does in nature. Mm -hmm. If you just leave a piece of food out in the forest, mm -hmm. if nothing eats it, it'll gradually rot. Yeah. And a mushroom will form on top of it or a mushroom will help it corrode. It kind mm -hmm. of helps raw food corrode. Right. Psychedelic mushrooms <coughs> help corrode the aspects of yourself that you want to let go of, but you can't. Mm -hmm. So say you're dealing with a heartbreak. Right. You're dealing with some failure or rejection in your career. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with something that's happened in your childhood, which you're not able to let go of. Right. That's the therapeutic perspective of mushrooms. I did it with a the shaman. There was meditation involved. There was breathing techniques involved. The ayahuasca gave me the gift of self-belief. Mm -hmm. The mushroom took me through a very deep experience, but did not give me any gift. It gave me tasks. Right. It definitely softened those three, four things I was fighting. Mm -hmm. And it also showed me a fifth thing. It showed me the relationship with my dad that I'm supposed to fix. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't something I was thinking of actively at that stage of my life. Right. But it just pointed me in that direction. So that maybe these four problems are also because of that partially, but you don't know it yet. Right. Opens up parts of your mind that you didn't know. So you do come out a different person because you've had sort of a higher experience. The one thing I gained from the mushroom experience, and you only realize this a few weeks after you've done it, mm -hmm. you realize, oh, I'm changed in this manner. So for me, it was empathy, which I believe the mushroom does for a lot of people because you're tapping into the mycelium network again. Mm -hmm. The earth's crust, the fungus that's in me is also in you. Mm -hmm. You have a very deep sense of empathy then for other people. Like I feel like I was always an empathetic person, but the empathy just skyrocketed to another level to the degree where it shifted my career goals from just a primarily capitalistic goals to a lot more social work related, mm -hmm. to a lot more outward, to a lot more, I don't know, almost healing related work because that's what the world needs right now. It doesn't need the capitalists yeah. or the individual heroes. It needs healers Absolutely. and artists yeah. and yeah. people who can put out help, but life changing. Like I remember I was having this conversation with you outside on the balcony. I said that I'm a little too chill nowadays, <laughs> almost to the degree where I question, I question how things are going so well, mm -hmm. you know, not skeptically, just a little experimentally right. and things were not so good before the mushroom experience, mm -hmm. but it's just changed my perception on myself and I'm much more kind of easy. I'm not that harsh on myself, right. probably empathy towards others also translated into empathy towards my own heart. What fascinates me about your story is because I, I would always be fascinated a person like you who's evolved, grown, learned through at a young age, you know, what would you get out of a trip? I've always thought about it. What would Ranveer get out of an LSD trip, out of an ayahuasca trip, out of a mushroom trip? And what you're saying, here's a deeper connection, which I'm sure you figured out. When can we feel empathy cannot be taught to people? We can only feel empathetic when we know that we're connected. You can only feel compassionate. A lot of people say, oh, let's be compassionate. You can't, unless you feel that there is a connection. And now because there's a connection, I feel I'm not alone, I'm not selfish. 
I can be empathetic. When I can feel someone else's pain, it could be a stranger. They say, they teach us when we do nutrition medicine for dying patients, you cannot be emotionally connected. Maybe that's right. But if I can't feel the, patient, the pain of my patient, I can't go to a degree of empathy, which will, give, which will make me give my 500%. I'm a robot. Mm. It is needed. We have to feel one another's pain. Pain is a beautiful thing. We can learn from other people's suffering because we're connected. Judgment happens easily when we judge people, when we see ourselves as isolations. But this connection that you're talking about and how it's made you empathetic is the true meaning of how we're supposed to be when it's empathy. A lot of people can talk you know, on empathy and spirituality, just textbook knowledge, but without feeling. Yeah. I mean, you did a beautiful podcast with uh, Gorgopal Das, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, one spiritual leader, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was him, where he summed up spirituality into the fact that there's a little bit of God in everyone. Mm. Just by knowing that, who am I to disrespect anyone? There is God. I may not like you, but disrespecting, putting you down, making intentions to crush you, I'm disrespecting God. Mm. And that's that's such a beautiful thing that shows us connection with one another. So now I'll be a little more compassionate. This is beautiful, Rand. Maybe the biological way of looking at it is there's a little bit of that mycelium network absolutely. in everyone. You can take that and absolutely connect it to that whole thing. See, we're a network. We are absolutely a network. And that's why vibes work. Mm. Why do we vibe with some people? We don't vibe with some people. Why do some relationships work out and some don't? Sometimes the connection just breaks and you think, how could this connection break? Because nothing's permanent. The pathway could have changed. Mm. One person could have evolved faster than you. You could have evolved faster than your partner. And now there's a disconnection. The network's broken. Can mm. it be fixed? Absolutely, yes. But you break a network in nature, two things can happen. Nature can fix that network or it will destroy that entire crop or that entire species of trees. Mm. In Goa, there's a mushroom which is no longer allowed to be taken. It's a beautiful, tasty mushroom. Because if you pluck out that mushroom, it is required for the termites no one wants termites in their home because they eat your wood. But in the forest, it is required. So by taking out mushrooms, you've disrupted an intelligence in these forests in Goa and the area around it, the Western Ghats and stuff like that, where you will destroy all nature in that area. And that ties in exactly what you're talking about, this network that exists above ground and underground. Yeah. Um, I mean, the mushroom trip, depending on how much you take, it can almost last you one whole day. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a synchronization process where everything you've experienced through the trip, you're supposed to write down yeah. or at least record in voice so that it stays in your consciousness. And those are your tasks that yeah. you'll have to perform over the following weeks or months. Uh, the weird thing I've noticed and I've had lots of conversations with successful, basically really kind of uh, capitalistic entrepreneurs who did experienced mm -hmm. mushrooms and then changed up completely. Daily, yeah. Again, opened up a whole social work <laughs> angle, etc. Uh, a lot of people had this common experience of definitely feeling another entity with you as is mm -hmm. the case with ayahuasca, but right. this is a genderless identity. Yeah. You know, ayahuasca, you feel like a woman's presence. Yeah. The second commonality that people said about mushroom experiences was that it does sort of take over your brain's voice neural pathways. In terms of the things you start hearing in your own mind, as well as the things you start saying are very strange. You're not able to form sentences. At mm -hmm. the, this is at the peak of your trip. Um, you're able to put words together, which form an idea. For example, um, uh, a friend of mine, his idea was God is to give. Mm -hmm. God is give, God is give. So it, it switched from God is shift to God is given. When he told me this, I kind of, I was like, yeah, that's it's a little silly. But when you go through the mushrooms yourself and you realize how it takes over your mind at the peak of the trip, yeah. where it gives you these little messages. I was dealing with like a bad breakup at that time. And I mainly okay. took it to kind of get passive because therapy wasn't working, etc. Okay. Mm -hmm. It just gave me the message that, um, uh, that that person where it didn't work out, it was to teach you to value the next one that comes in yeah. because even you are at fault. It wasn't just the other person's fault because that's what we tend to do as humans. And yeah. with our human ego, we kind of have this, Oh, I did nothing wrong yeah. uh, in that past moment, but you, you did do some wrong things and it's important to acknowledge that and move forward in life. So empathy again, even yeah. for who you consider to be the biggest villains in your life, right? It teaches you empathy through these little commandments and those mm -hmm. commandments you're supposed to write down and act upon. Right. Uh, the other kind of commandment I got was to spend a lot more time with my closest family members mm -hmm. who are aging now, where your roles are switching, where you're not the kid anymore. You're probably becoming the parent. Yeah. You know, and eventually when they are old, you become the parent, they're the kids. 
But right now you're at the stage where y'all are the same age. It's like Benjamin Button, the movie, mm-hmm. yeah. where he meets the girl at the age yeah. of 40 and they're the same age for that one moment in their life. Yeah. When you're 30 years old as an adult in India, you're often at the same mental age as your parents. parents yeah. After this, things are going to switch. And this mm-hmm. is the point where you need to take control of things. Yeah. So anyway, that was my trip. No, I think that's amazing. And there are so many messages that people need to take from this. One is the structure that you put in, the intention that you set. It's all about intention. Yeah. No, and I'm It's not, all about intention. Not doing yeah. it for fun. Yeah. I mean, you, we can make things fun, but again, intention again. Mm. You know, most people's intention, like, I mean, I grew up in Goa, the whole hippie thing. I've seen how rave parties change from then to what they are now. What are they now? Like now, it's it's a... It's a fest to pick up women, men, show who's better, flash Rolexes at a rave party where before you would have the least clothing on. I mean, you know, like you wouldn't care about, you don't dress up. You're in comfortable short pants, no shirt, whatever and stuff. And, and you're dancing. The idea is music, dancing, connection with nature, all the elements together. Today, it's LSD with a beer bottle with five shots in between. It's, it's a mess because no one understands. People are doing it to show off, to want, and they think they're doing something cool. So the whole point is maybe that's the way it is right now, but that's what gives all these therapeutic angles of psychedelics a bad name. Mm. There is so much of potential in them, so much. So if you really come down to the science, because I've also, also tried to figure out like, how much of our brain do we actually use? Very little of it. Because we're, it's number one, too much of content. Number two, we don't give it a break. Number three, the dopamine burnout is a chemical imbalance on its own. Mm. So we ourselves are not using our full potential of the brain. Like in the movie Limitless, what worked? You just opened up parts of the brain that weren't being used. You didn't create anything new. You just started using what exists. Mm. And that's what psychedelics do. It Mm. opens up parts that already exist. And that's why you can see your faults. When I say you people, relationships, everything in your life. It will show you your responsibilities because there's clarity. So now if I break it down, because many people may not want to do psychedelics, that's where meditation comes in. Meditation will open parts of your brain that gives you clarity, which is not controlled by your perceptions built up by social media, society, and everything else, that this is truly who I need to be at this phase in my life. And that's why you can chill right now. Yeah, the neuroscience of what you just said, and I spoke about this to Dr. Sid Warrior. You should check out Ah, the podcast we've done. Okay. Um, There's basically a part of your cerebrum in Mm -hmm. your brain which is in charge of you identifying yourself. This is my body. This, these are the limits of my physical body. My name is Ranveer. I'm 29 years old. Mm -hmm. This is what I do for a living. This is the identity. All this is self-identification. When you go to slightly technical meditations or deeper meditations, or just you're consistent with your meditations at the peak of your meditation sessions, and these could be as short as like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that particular part of your cerebrum the activity reduces. Mm -hmm. That's what they've figured out through experimentation. That's why there are so many studies related to meditations that are coming out. Now, what happens when you identify less with yourself? Mm -hmm. At least while you're at the peak of your meditation, you identify less with your own ego and you're able to see your own life from a third person perspective. It's almost like having an out of body experience, but from a more mental level. Oh, this is why I'm overthinking. Yeah. Oh, this is how I can solve the overthinking. Oh, that thing that's not getting solved at my office, this is how I can solve it. Because you're not thinking from a place of what will I lose here? Absolutely. How much yeah. of my time will I put in here? There's no my, there's no I. But that's the power of meditation in the long term yeah. that professionals need to understand basically. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, I love what you said because see, reality is reality. Mm. We Everyone has to face it right now. The ego likes to be happy. Mm. The ego wants to be happy. It wants to feel right. But reality is reality. You made a mistake. You made a mistake. Now, the ego may want to cover it up or justify or blame. Like you honestly said, I love what you said about it. Every relationship, we always think it's the partner. But when we evaluate, we realize who we were being. And it's a good thing. So maybe that person didn't deserve you in that phase. Mm -hmm. Or you didn't deserve that person. It's not about what we think. It's about who we are. I always look at a breakup or a negative thing as either a lesson, a mistake. A mistake could also be, you know, when someone rejects you. Today on social media, so many people look, but how could she reject me? How could he? I'm saying, look at it differently. I wish it didn't happen. It's painful. I would feel your pain, but look at it differently. Hmm. Maybe that person is just a lesson in your life right now. A person can be a blessing or a person can be a lesson. Hmm. Rejection can be your saving grace sometimes. It could be a saving grace. Yeah. Let's talk about the dark night of the soul. Mm-hmm. Fantastic concept that you told Jesseline Royal and myself <laughs> about. Uh, I think both of us are going through slightly 
challenging phases back then yeah what is the dark night of the soul so the dark night of the soul is covered in every single religion in different ways okay it's just termed differently so the dark night of the soul is when you have to hit rock bottom you have to hit rock bottom in order to come back new it's like a, a, a snake that sheds skin it's part of them they need to shed their skin to have a new skin grow we as humans they want to hold on to everything if we hit rock bottom we think it's the end and that's that fine line between depression okay where you say you put yourself in victim mode i understand it can be very very difficult for a lot of depressed people chemical imbalances you need the support of drugs all that. but a lot of them it's perception i hit rock bottom i'm a failure you've labeled yourself no one has you have the point is to go through the dark night of the soul it is going to be it can be one day it could be several weeks it could be 6 months it could be a year okay but immediately most of us never go through that dark night on the other side of the dark night of the soul is the new you is the new you where you may never need psychedelics because you've gone through the journey of the dark night of the soul now what happens in the dark night of the soul you hit rock bottom you realize you're worthless but you have a whole world telling you to affirm i am worthy i am worthy so you're constantly confused but you feel worthless that's your main feeling what is it teaching you from there what is making me feel worthless who is making me feel worthless so at the dark night of the soul you are at your rock bottom and you go through that rock bottom you don't try to take drugs to feel better you don't try to take alcohol to feel better you don't shop have mindless sex to feel better because the moment you do that you're not going through that journey anymore you're coping mm. if i remove the coping away from it i am taken through that dark side i shed layers like what vipassana does in 10 days where you shed and you shed and you cry and you come out new but then you come back to reality and and that's why you have to keep going back for it through the dark night of the soul the shedding happens once and for all what do you think happens biologically when you cry especially let's talk about crying for guys mm -hmm. biologically what's happening because i feel there's a layer of hormones involved mm -hmm. but of when course. we talk about it from yeah. an ayahuasca shrooms perspective there's also emotional toxins that you release in your tears what do you think these emotional toxins are what do you so think emotional toxins on? are based on all the negativity that you've suppressed resentment guilt betrayal hurt all of that whether you've done it or someone's done to you i think crying is one of the most powerful medicines and we want men to cry we want boys to cry of course people are going to don't cry for stupid stuff okay uh, your girlfriend said this to you you're hurt you're going to cry in front of her no but you can go into your own space and cry your heart out because i can guarantee you one thing after you cry the feeling that you have is not good it's empowering mm. you feel this internal strength that has come up because everyone said that boys don't cry or girl if you cry or a girl or etc et of course when men if if there's a, if i need to be the strongest man in the room because there's a chaos chaos happening by crying i'm going to make everyone think i've given up i'll hold that emotion but i will cry later there is nothing wrong crying is therapeutic there is science in it i get my cancer patients to cry all the time i say please cry because a lot of people saying laugh 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 positive think positive think positive is the worst advice mm. the worst advice i i would say be away or just just disregard when people tell you think positive all the time no you have to allow negative thoughts to come into your mind which they will but how you channel how much time you choose to spend in that negative thoughts is your fault mm. if i allow that to pull me down i'm going to spiral but i want a negative thought right now to realize how it makes me feel and how i'm making other people feel mm. but now how quickly can i channel it into the right thought mm. so i think crying is beautiful and sometimes pick up an incident from your past go through it in detail yeah and cry yeah that is also part of your healing journey if you're finding it difficult to forgive someone okay cry and again the beauty comes back to traditional india again and all religions when someone dies in your family you are supposed to go through the grieving process for hindus some parts of hinduism is 14 days for muslims i know it's 14 days for catholics it's 14 days 12 to 14 days you're supposed to stop all aspects of your life be with your family cry and grieve no one wants to do that today so they jump back into their lives to cope with it go out with friends drink try to forget but that suppressed grief has to come up and it never lets them move on with their life completely so a lot of people seeing therapists need to be told finish the grieving process completely then it's like you've gone through the dark night of the soul for that loss of that special loved one in your life and now you come back renewed yeah. but if i've tried to suppress that any emotion that anyone is suppressing today has to come up it can come up in anger violence disease frustration but it has to come up and why can i say that because i deal with end of life 
patients for nine years and anything, any patient on their dying bed, they're not dying. They're suffering. Even the doctors are like, this patient needs to go have mercy. Like, let him go, you know, whatever. They're not dying. They have not finished something that they have to finish. And then it comes out. Call that brother of mine. He's really? in Germany. It's unbelievable. So a lot of people, when they want their suffering to end, you have to finish what you have not finished on this. Wow. It's unbelievable. You know, a lot of people will see it spiritually. I, I can see it in front. So when I get, I'll give you an example, okay? I don't know if my family would like me sharing this, but hardcore. So my dad, 80 years old, got a prostate cancer, all of that stuff, whatever. We grew up, he had a fight with his sister, whatever. For years, we've seen it happening as a kid. Now he's in recovery process, miraculous recovery. I didn't think he would reach this far. It's been almost a year. The other day, that aunt lives opposite us in Goa in our compound. The other day, he walks out of the house, my dad, okay? He needs a little help to walk, but he walked out alone. And he told us that he's going to meet a friend of his. So the help ran behind him. I wasn't there. He's walking towards the gate. He walks back, this very confused look. My brother was looking, what's going on? And he walks into that aunt's house and he sits there and he talks to her for two hours. Mm -hmm. That guidance came from the top. His suffering after that day has decreased in front of our eyes. Unbelievable. And I'm giving you an example because it's a personal example, but I see this with patients all the time. So I ask patients, who is it that you need to forgive? You got to do it now for your suffering to end. You got to let go, but you cannot keep anything suppressed. Because you work with so many cancer patients, do you think there's a spiritual aspect of cancer? Absolutely. 100%. See, because again, if you lock yourself in science, it doesn't make sense. Because where has science studied spirituality? Just because you haven't studied it doesn't give you the right to put it down. Every disease in the body, I'll tell you why, okay? Only the human body can get sick. The spirit can never get sick. Mm. That's how our souls move on. The spirit can never get sick. It can get dampened. It can get bruised. It can never get sick. Only the physical body can get sick. Do you think if the spirit gets bruised, that bruise translates to the, the physical, physical sickness? Body? Absolutely. I will tell you today outright, 90% of my breast cancer patients will tell you, maybe not in the first month, not second, not third month, not fourth month. Now I've stopped asking because they come directly to me. It was caused because of this emotional issue in my life and they'll pinpoint it. And they're right. Do you notice that when you're dealing with different kinds of cancer that there are some commonalities? Absolutely. Prostate cancers will be irritability, anger, frustrations, in small bits, larger suppression of anger, insecurity at a huge level. Most ER positive breast cancers will be emotional hurt, betrayal, pain. Thyroid cancers will be the lack of voicing yourself. You trying to be someone else because you can never voice who you really want to be. There is, it's not the only cause. It's not the only cause, but it is a huge part of the cause. The main cause is a breakdown in the immune system. You can only have cancer if your immune system broke down, period. Mm. But for that immune system to break down, that's why doctors tell you, oh, stress, don't be stressed. It'll cause your immune system to be low. It's true. But now because your immune system is low, you can have any other disease, right? You've broken down the main defense system of your body. So yes, there is an emotional, spiritual connection with every disease. From a miscarriage to a deadly disease, there is an emotional connection. Mm. And a lot of our patients who have had miscarriages, there are many, many, many uses, uh, uh, causes of a miscarriage, but you know the one that comes out more prominently now and ask every patient who's gone through, at any point did you reject this child in your mind? And in most cases of miscarriages, most, not all, the mother was, yes, I never wanted to have the child, but my husband or my in-laws or my whatever. You as the mother, the source of holding a child has rejected it at a subconscious level. Your body will make sure you don't have the child. It is insane how the human body works. So now psychotropics and psychedelics can make people see that. Mm. They can see that, who they were being, and they find their own solutions. And the beauty of magic mushrooms, ayahuasca's, LSD's, right quality, done within the framework of your laws. Some countries allow it, just follow your laws. My point is, it gives you the answers that have already existed, but you've wasted a lifetime trying to get opinions from other people and answers from other people, where bio-individuality comes in again. So today, you go for relationship advice to your 10 best friends. All you're getting is 10 opinions. These 10 opinions coming from your friends, yeah, they care for you. They want the best man for you or the best woman. But they are giving you 10 opinions based on their relationships and their understanding of love and their perception of love, which is why it is always going to be your wrong advice. Mm. If you want to know who you need to be in, you look within. You have to look within for that answer. No one can tell you whether you should be divorced or not. The answer has to come from within. It comes to the question of so many women living and men living in 
relationships where they're physically abused. And today it's not only about women. You know, men get physically abused yeah. in our country. Men get beaten up. And we ask them, why are you still in that relationship? Because they're willing to see beyond the abuse. They have learned to see that. But this part of me is deeply in love with that part of you. Now, society will come in and tell you, you don't deserve this. You don't need this. But that person has chosen to sacrifice the physical abuse for something much larger. Much, is that right? It's right for them. It's wrong for us to judge. Now, mm -hmm. someone's being physically abused and they need help to come out of it. Of course, that's a different situation. We can never judge anyone. And the human mind as much, like if you ask me what my spiritual goal is, I would like to reach a point where I am so much better than not judging people. But it's human. It's coming all the time because we're seeing it all the time. People on social media, criticism, trolls, all of that stuff. But the point is our judgments are never right because they're based on opinions and never facts. Mm, and, you know, your opinion and your facts are dependent on your subjective reality. My childhood, what my dad said to me, what my mother put in my head, what my teacher said, they're just opinions. So just because people have a following today on Instagram, they think they can tell people how to run relationships. So when people say, Luke, how do I run it? I said, run it. You learn along the way. Why are you trying to protect yourself? Because right now you only expect the best out of your relationship. You think you're entitled to only the good times. You prepare yourself for the bad times. You go through the relationship and you learn. It doesn't have to be your final. It could be 10 relationships before you find love, but that's your journey. If you are not going to take that journey, you're going to be the person sitting on social media asking the world for opinions. You know, strangely enough, my ayahuasca shaman had told me this uh, concept. He spoke about how in many ancient shamanic cultures, they believe that before your soul enters a human life, when you go into your to be mother's womb and you uh, kind of take over that baby's body, mm -hmm. which is soulless until yeah. a certain point, your soul has figured out that in the following lifetime, I have to figure these lessons for myself. Mm -hmm. I have to go through these learnings. Yeah. So often you choose your own suffering because there's no concept of time in the heavenly skies. Correct. Yeah. Uh, it's all just timeless. It's it's a dimension that's beyond time. And again, we could get into astrophysics. We've spoken to Abhijit Chavda on the show about how even science hasn't understood the concept of Correct. time. Yeah. And it just uses time to explain certain physics Correct. equations. But but it's I, not in completion. Yeah, yeah. People don't understand what time even means. Mm -hmm. um, multiverse theory state that whatever happened 10 years ago is happening right now in this very moment. Mm. So keeping this whole metaphysical uh, concept in mind, do you feel that's true? That when your spirit is entering a human life, your spirit chooses its own suffering and you go through a certain pattern? I've read about it. My belief systems haven't moved there, but I do believe that every experience that we're going through is for a reason. At the same time, sometimes we create because of our actions and behaviors, certain phases of love life that we'll have to go through. So we can't always say, because a lot of people use that as a crutch. Oh, this is what life's putting me, so I don't take responsibility. But in many cases, I am doing something which is not right that is bringing on that particular suffering, which is within my control. But sometimes I'm going through something like a breakup, which I'll never understand why such a connection where I could love someone or you could love someone is suddenly taken away. We'll never understand this. But that, you could say, is that soul experience, which is why you need to go through it. If you resist it, you're not going to learn that lesson and it's going to happen to you over and over again. Let me turn the question around a bit. I know you're a man of God. What's that one moment in your life where you felt the closest to God? I feel it almost every day because when I have certain cases and I can tell you this up front, I had a case the other day as well. You're hit with a question where you know you don't know the answer and all of a sudden you're talking to that patient. It's coming out. God's talking through me. I'm not here to say I'm a channel of God. All of us are channels of God, by the way. We should know that. God's passing a message through everyone. But the point is I have... I am experienced to know when God is talking to me. And I look at my doctors and nutritionists and I'll say, they, because they'll be like, Luke, where did that come from? Up. So I am connected with God. And I notice the days I start my day off badly, for example, anything, that connection is broken. I will cancel patient appointments. But the days that it's there, there are some things like I had a client the other day who was like, fly me to Switzerland. I want euthanasia. I don't want to suffer anymore. I want to die. So was, she wants to die. My first, my, when she saw me, she was saying, Luke, please tell my family I want to die. Tell all these doctors to leave me alone. I want to die. They don't have a right to do this to me. I want to die. What do you answer in this case? What do you answer? What followed was a 20-minute 
you know, narrative from me to the patient, which was not me. I'm not going to take credit for it. I've not learned it. I've not experienced that. It came from a higher power. You may want to call it God. You may want to call it whatever. But it came out. That patient in half an hour changed their perception. It's nine days since I saw the patient. The husband is like, she's a different person. Because of me? No, because I know it wasn't me. So God connects through me in different ways. And when you're mindful, you recognize it. You will recognize it at that point. I believe we're already close to God. But because our mind is so distorted all the time with other people's opinions, we're comparing ourselves with people. We're so ungrateful. We look in the mirror and we hate ourselves. You know, we've become so ungrateful for our very spirit that we've created more distance. So even though God is there, we can't feel it. We can't feel it. Mm. But I believe everyone, everyone right now, whether they believe it or not, God is in them. Yeah, I think a great movie to watch is Soul, Pixar. Soul. Yeah, I love that. I love, I love state. that movie. Flow state, exactly. So mm. what I told you initially, I'm in one of my happiest spaces right now because I'm in flow. How am I in flow? Because I'm not resisting. And it's a beautiful space. Beautiful space. I don't know how long it's going to last, but it's great right now. And I'm mindful that I want more of it. So that's how I'm leading my life right now. Mm. I teach my cancer patients, be in a state of flow. Don't resist the chemotherapy. You've decided to take it, right? Good. If you've not decided to take it, it's fine. But if you've decided, now flow with it. Forget about what's going to happen. It's going to happen the way it's supposed to. And the patients who flow, they don't have side effects at all. It's insane. Insane. They don't have any side effects. Um, you know, for me, I mean, definitely because... You, if you're in a creative profession, you do feel moments where you're closer to God or moments where right. you're like, how did I write this? <clears throat> yeah. How did I exactly. come up with this? Exactly. Um, and now you can be egoistic and say, oh, wow, I'm amazing. I'm super. Yeah. I mean, you can be as humble as you are. It came from somewhere. And give that credit because if you give that credit, it's going to come more and more. Philippians 4.13. It's, Absolutely. That's the core logic. And again, it's something every religion yeah. says yeah. that any form of creativity is not your own. It's from God. Yeah. So if you're open to it, if you're vibrating at the right levels, you are in a state of receiving. Yeah. Most people are in a state of getting. I want to get rich. I want to get this low state. Open to, I want to receive healing. I want to receive abundance. I want to receive love. It changes everything mm. in the most magical way. Mm. Never looked at love that way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, A.R. Rahman said on this show, that uh, he, I asked him, how do you come up with so many tunes for mm. so long? 13 mm. years of coming yeah, out yeah. magical music. He spoke about a Sufi story about a beggar and his beggar's bowl. So he said that you need to perceive yourself as the beggar. Keep your beggar's bowl empty all the time. Mm. God will keep placing things into it. But the moment you let it stay in the beggar's bowl and get attached to what is in your bowl, which means his tunes or his music and him saying, oh, I made this beautiful yeah. song. Yeah. God's not going to put the next piece of food in your yeah. bowl. The next tune is not going to fall in your bowl. It's the same concept. This is A.R. Rahman, one of the creative Amazing. geniuses of yeah. our culture saying this. Yeah. And I speak to most creative professionals, they always say, always say the same thing. That yeah. this script or this uh, idea wasn't mine. It came from somewhere. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Beautiful concept. But, you know, and flow state is definitely a part of my life where I feel close to God. Yeah. There was a moment when I was 14 years old where I almost died. And in my childhood... That was probably the closest I've ever felt to God. It mm -hmm. kind of also changed my perception a little bit. Between 8th and ninth grade, I was surrounded by a lot of my friends who were very fascinated by atheism. And there was okay. this cool guy group in class. And of course, I was a part of it. Everyone was talking about atheism. And I just sat with that concept for a bit. Because mm -hmm. I'd been brought up in a very spiritual family. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, you're kind of experimenting with rebellion as a teenager. Right. So I thought, mm, atheism, yeah, there is an argument for it. Like I've not experienced God. I don't, you know, it, it maybe it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, it's only science and it's only what we are. Yeah. And it's the world we know. Um, cut to this Jaipur trip where we were, we were going from Jaipur to Ranthambore. I was sitting on the first seat of a bus. Okay. And uh, there's people behind me. Everyone's playing these uh, games, mafia and those kind of games in the bus. There's someone's playing dumb charades. Someone's doing something else. I was just insanely sleepy that day for some reason. I slept well, but I remember being really sleepy. So I didn't want to be a part of the game. Mm -hmm. so I went to the first seat and sat right behind where the bus driver sits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, great kind of drive from Jaipur to Rantambur. Feeling super sleepy. Myself and my vice principal went to sleep on the first seat. Mm. Okay. And while I'm at the peak of my sleep, I hear like screams behind me. Okay, and I hear some of my friends, I can identify their voices. 
and these girls behind me are going oh and i wake up with that hmm. okay so my eyes open and i see a bus coming straight at us like there's a bus right in front of me the only thing that separates that bus from me is the bus driver um our guy couldn't see the bus coming from the other side it was trying to overtake a vehicle on the other mm-hmm. side and just when the buses were about to touch our bus driver kind of turned the bus mm. so this other bus hit my bus or our bus behind okay the impact was not head on it was behind mm-hmm. what that led to was that our bus kind of lost control then he the guy tried controlling it a bit and rammed into a tree this happened over maybe 10 seconds mm-hmm. what i remember is i remember the scream mm-hmm. okay i don't know what happened to me but it was one of those zones where everything slowed down a bit i quickly looked behind to understand what's happening like the moment i realized oh we're in an accident so the moment he turned my Im- immediate impulse was to look behind yeah. maybe it's the martial arts at play where you're so aware of your body and your yeah. surroundings so i looked behind i saw that the people who were playing dumb charades the the other games everyone was slightly injured mm. someone had a cut on their face someone was bleeding from their mouth someone had a cut on their head nothing happened to me yeah. but the second impact was about to happen and i'm not making this up and i'm not spoken about this online the vice principal she fell off her seat because of the first con- contact mm-hmm. and she was on the floor and again martial arts at play probably god at play i don't know what happened i became hyper aware and between the first and the second contact there was about 4 seconds i quickly went and kind of pushed her back on her seat hmm. and then we crashed into the tree the driver got very badly injured okay he was rushed to a hospital there was blood all over the front seat the glass that separates me and the driver it shattered but i don't know how the glass didn't fall on me mm-hmm. it fell on him okay and at that moment between those two crashes that's why i go i became aware of god i don't yeah. i don't, see i'm i'm struggling to even talk about it i don't know what i felt in that moment i saw that my vice principal safe on her seat and i kind of kicked back in my senses look behind and all my friends are crying people yeah. are bleeding this broken glass everywhere someone's fainted i can see someone's fucking body like you know just lying mm-hmm. down on the window Okay, now I turn around and I see like a, I see a picture of Hanuman Ji, which mm-hmm. for me that time was my image of God. It still mm-hmm. is in many ways, but mm-hmm. and I'm unscratched, nothing. While I'm on the front seat of a bus, and even my vice principal is relatively unhurt, and she comes up to me and says, "Thank you. I realized what you did." Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, I got out of the bus, and there's another picture of Hanuman Ji again at a dhaba that we've crashed near. Mm-hmm. And the dhaba people are freaking out. They're like, "We just saw a huge accident. What is happening here?" I got out of the bus. I realized, "Oh wait, my friends are inside." Went and picked up one of my friends, got mm-hmm. him out of the bus, uh, brought him out. People come out. Everyone's bleeding. I don't know what got into me, but I went to a part of the dhaba that was like just empty, and I sat down and prayed. Mm-hmm. And my atheism died there. <laughs> like unbelievable there was not yeah. one atheist <laughs> cell in my body after that yeah. like what just happened here <laughs> my best friend cut his tongue in half mm-hmm. someone else had to get stitches across their face someone else had a jaw injury which troubles them even today like mm-hmm. this was 14 years ago 15 years ago yeah. nothing happened to me other than my atheism dying and wow. that's the closest i felt to god yeah. No, I think I mean it's it's amazing how you were so mindful and you're still mindful. A lot of people forget these things, and this is what we call as divine grace. Like everyone has divine grace. No one can explain how they got safely to work today. Why weren't they in that train accident? Why weren't they in that flight which crashed? It's divine grace. I was with a surgeon in New York a couple of days ago. Young guy. He's a pediatric transplant surgeon, so he does transplants on two-year-olds and one-year-olds and stuff. And he was saying, you know, so we were talking about spirituality and God and stuff. I said, "Do you believe in God, spirituality, and stuff?" He said, "Luke, I'm. I used to be the most egoistic surgeons. Most surgeons are egoistic, is what he said, because we're given that control, life and death in our hands. Saying every time I cut open a human body, all I see is the intelligence of God, because as a surgeon, we know." 
what we're doing is what we're doing, but we see the intelligence of the veins and the arteries coming in, pumping and saying, I just see God every time I open a body. You call it spiritual, you call it what you want, but that intelligence in us, even while we're all awake right now, there's no reason that our body has to be working every second of the day and night to keep us alive. That's intelligence, that is a superpower. So when people don't have answers for all of these things, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist just because we don't understand it. It doesn't mean like, if just because people don't understand psychedelics, doesn't mean that it isn't good. So understanding plays a huge role. And when, you, when you're mindful enough to see everything unexplained, how does this plant in a room create energy? How does the touch of someone that you love have a healing effect? Mm. How does the smile of a child melt you or make you feel so good? All of these are unexplained. Science cannot explain it. It's a superpower. And those who are humble and respectful of that superpower are protected and guided. Mm. And you know, you spoke about receiving. Uh, we spoke about receiving blessings mm -hmm. or money or love. Yeah. The other thing you can be open to receiving is knowledge, but you just need so to okay. keep your an boundaries open. Mind. open. Yeah, keep your boundaries open. Everything should be open. I, as an expert, like today, everything that I'm saying on, your pod, pod, on this podcast is my story. My story doesn't have to become someone else's story. Yeah. Someone else's story doesn't have to become mine, but there's an essence that we take away. Yeah. We don't blindly say, oh, I need to do this to be like Luke or be like Ranbir. No, I take an essence away to be my unique self, mm. who I'm supposed to be. Mm. Wow, I think we've reached the end of this heavy <laughs> ass episode. <laughs> Luke, do you have any last bit or anecdotes to add, you know, to, I don't even know what we've just created. Honestly, this was <laughs> just you and me meeting. This is how our real life conversations are. You, you've always helped me every time I've met you. There's always some kind of healing or help that I get from you. For the first time in my life, I feel I'm healed enough to talk to you at your level. I'm not saying I'm not got gotten things from you, like the receiving love thing. Mm -hmm. Never looked at love that way. So mm -hmm. thank you, brother. <laughs> That's what I'm learning right now at my age too. It's all about receiving. No, but I think, I mean, we, we did a show a long time ago and I love how you've evolved. I see it every day. I mean, I follow your page. Some days I miss seeing your stuff, but the way you've evolved and we should never be scared of evolving. I think right now my message for people out there is don't put yourself into a box. Too many people, you know, they put themselves, I'm a Gen Z, I'm a millennial, I'm a boomer, I'm what? Why? Get yourself out of a box. You're a unique, powerful, extraordinary human being. If you put yourself in that box, you're going to behave like that. And that is society's puppet. Do you want to be society's puppet? Or do you want to take this unique talent? Everyone has a gift. That's what I've seen in life. Everyone has a gift. Most people don't even know that because they're trying to live someone else's life. But when you start to live your life, you'll find your gift could be as simple as listening, mm. drawing, art, creating. That could be a simple gift, but since everyone's comparing, they think their gifts is, gift is only about billion dollars, success, fame, looking good. And that's why at that level of society, it's the most shallow, unhappy yeah. level of society. And you go down and strip off layers, you come down to simplicity. To reach that, forget about meditation and simplicity. First move out of the box that you put yourself in. Because then you've opened up your whole mind and body to receiving. If you're in a box, you got a lid on to receiving. You remove the lid and come out, you are living in awe and curiosity and with wonder. And that is how human beings evolve because we're living in wonder. We're living in awe. We're not living with entitlement that, oh, love should be like this, career should be like this, money should feel like this. So I encourage people to start living their lives with awe, curiosity, and wonder. So, um, so just, I mean, I've toyed with stopping the podcast so much mm -hmm. and my team is so against that idea but uh, it's kind of gone beyond the chase for social media growth and numbers where right. I don't have a need to really read books anymore and this is becoming like reading a new book with every great episode so I'm mm -hmm. ending up reading like three four books a week amazing yeah so uh, I think just on a personal level hopefully that on the day I die I'm going to look back at this phase as the most intensive learning phase, but you never know. You never know where life will take you. Absolutely. That's not for us to decide because we all have our paths defined, but I agree with your team. You shouldn't stop the podcast. I'll tell you why. I mean, you can take days of breaks. You can decide how to, because what you're doing is you're taking knowledge from people and you're sharing that knowledge and inspiring so many people. I mean, you don't inspire just the youth. You've inspired my 50, 60, 70 year old patients as well. So what you're doing is you're actually building a legacy. When people say, Luke, what's your intention behind what you do? I want to leave a legacy. 
because I have the ability to do it. I want to leave a legacy. You are leaving a legacy in your own way with all the content that you're putting together and sharing it. Whether people use it or not, it's a different thing. Trolls are going to be trolls. You know how I see trolls now? I feel that I'm giving them a job. Any troll today, I've employed them. I've given them a job to use their time to troll. That's how I started looking at all of these things and stuff like that. Give them work. Give them work. Let them troll. That's their job. That's what makes them happy. But it doesn't define who you are or who everyone is. Because a lot of people are crumbling under trolling and everything like that. We have so many depressed influencers. Successful. Oof. They come to us, look at depressed, the troll. How could he say that? Relax. Relax. Just think of it as you've given a job to someone today. Mm. That's their life part. Let them do their job of trolling. You do your job of being extraordinary. Yeah, You know, things have not completely healed with my dad and uh, people keep asking us to bring my dad on the show often. Mm -hmm. I have not reached that level where I can talk to my dad at the same level I can talk yeah. to you. Yeah, I have made peace with it and I will bring him on the show at some point when I'm ready myself. Mm -hmm. uh, some people might look at the situation like I'm trying to put my personal life out there too much mm -hmm. and there's certain things you should keep to yourself. I feel most Indian guys have daddy issues. <laughs> <laughs> and if we showcase one daddy issue story well and talk about how to make peace with it and talk about how to kind of figure it out, it's going to help a lot of other people out there. Absolutely. I've not had a reference point in world culture other than maybe Kevin Hart, who's figured out his own daddy issues and mm -hmm. come out on top of it in a peaceful way where both him and his father are happy. Right. The one thing I figured out that lifelong daddy issues have done to me is that I always seek out older male company because mm -hmm. I never got it. As right. a kid. Right. Uh, and you've definitely been one of those people. I don't call mm -hmm. you a, my father figure, but you're definitely mm -hmm. like a brother figure. Mm -hmm. and I've, Thank you. Yeah. I've had father figures maybe when I was younger. Right. But I can't talk to father figures about uh, mescaline and Saito <laughs> Sivan and all these things yeah. we talk about, Luke. Um, I do have some last kind of questions I wish to ask you again from that perspective mm -hmm. because I don't have the balls or the heart to talk to my dad about these things. But mm -hmm. I'm noticing that as I'm entering my 30s, I'm feeling a lot stronger and stronger is a subjective term. I also kind of feel very detached. It's a very detached warrior kind of mentality. But I'm really in control of my emotions. Right. Is this natural? Do I flow with it? Or am I just becoming heartless? And did you go through this at any phase where you felt a strong sense of detachment which was giving you power? Mm -hmm. what, what's your so you should on? flow with it because you're able to still maintain empathy. So you're not becoming heartless. So you should flow with it. Because you're in a state of more empathy right now. So you are doing it with heart in. We've all gone through that phase. To so come back to daddy issues, there's one perspective that I want to give you sure. to reflect on. No, please. Okay? Almost every son will have an issue. Okay? Number one, because they are two male energies, there is always going to be conflict. Every single relationship. Some kids are good at, screw it, I don't give a damn. Some are not. They're emotionally attached. Okay, I'll give you a perspective of what changed my relationship with my... We had a great relationship, but there are st still date things that I don't like. You know what he told me when I went to speak to him? He said, that was the best I could do with the knowledge I had and the upbringing I had. Yeah. I'm sorry, you be a better father to your child. And I felt that was the most beautiful thing. He didn't owe me an apology. He gave me an apology. He said, this is how I was brought up to do this, this, this. I didn't know better. And then it made me realize no parent gets trained to be a parent. No mother gets trained to be a mother. No child gets trained to be a child. No teenager gets trained to be a teenager. We flow through life. So now some people can have really bad daddy issues where, you know, many people, they're beaten this, that, whatever, or, or they were never there. The point is, what can you take from that suffering that you think or that lack of that relationship with your father? And what can you, how can you con convert that into your superpower. You know, a lot of successful people where they say, Luke, we can't find our purpose in life. A lot of people have found their purpose in life by taking that suffering and saying, I don't want, like exactly, exactly what you're doing. You don't want other kids to have that kind of relationship. So here you are trying to fix a problem that a lot of other boys and young men are going through, which are daddy issues. So your sense of purpose is to fix that by probably sharing your experience. Flow with it, but go back and think. Was your father doing it intentionally? Everyone has an ego. Your father, you as well. Me, my father as well. Especially the male egos. That's why we bond more with our moms and daughters bond more with their dads. We have to recognize that because your father, take away society, is a provider and a protector. 
we are all driven by primal fears. When I look today at why a lot of my relationships failed, whether it was from the girl's side or my side, what drives me into a relationship? What is my primal, what is my primal driver? To protect and to provide. So tomorrow, if I am going to be with a woman who says, I don't need protection, I don't need provision, I'm not going to get into a relationship. I respect that woman. But you don't give my primal driver what it needs to survive and thrive, which is my expression of love. Mm. It is very important that we understand that. So when I look at my father today and I say, you didn't spend time with us, you were doing this, this. My job was to protect, put food on the table, provide. I've given you all of that. I'm sorry I couldn't give you time. That's it. That's the way he was brought up. So there is always place for a beautiful word called understanding. And of course, there are some unforgivable things that fathers do to their kids and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. We, the kid may need therapy and all of that stuff, but allow space for understanding. Your father at that point only knew what he knew. Now, sometimes if you see intentionally, my father did this to me out of ego pride and I was like, yes, sit him down, speak to him, all of that stuff, make that peace. But in many cases, you'll find that every human being in life was going through their own life struggles and trying to be the best. And most parents intentionally have tried to do their best. They've just fallen short. Today, we as a society know what a perfect parenthood looks like. And now we compare our childhood and we realize, but when we were a child, I never had these issues with my dad. Only when mm -hmm. I got more knowledge that, oh, that guy's father handled this, my father didn't do it. So now I'm comparing and say, why didn't my father do this? So there's place for reflection, but communication is the best. Mm -hmm. My right. father still will show an ego. He will still say, I'm the head of the family. And when I say ego, I am the head of the family. And he is the head of the family, mm -hmm. period. These are my jobs. Your mother is the head of the family and this is what she does. And my mother gratefully accepts it. There's no ego. For them, it's principle and it is task and duty. Mm. They're still together mm. at 80. They're not divorced to 20. They're not falling apart. They fight. They do all of that stuff. So I learn like this all the time. Now, again, this is my story. My story doesn't have to be someone else's, but the principle remains the same. Understanding who was your father trying to be? Who were you at that stage? Who are you now? Who was your father then? Everything's changed. So it allows space for some amount of acceptance, understanding, but the intention should be, how can I create peace? So I know I love my father, I know he loves me. We can have disagreements, but it doesn't change what we have in between. Lucretino, the world needs more people like yourself. And like you. <laughs> no, no, brother. I think, I think uh, there are some people who just notice that destiny pushes them into purposes which are, you know, for other people rather than themselves. And uh, fortunately, if life makes two such people meet, podcasts get created. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just, I feel like, you know, life is a, life is a journey that's full of learning, full of yeah. healing and cliche is just like this. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Just one big thank you once again, Luke. Oh, Coutinho. thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I love your journey. I just keep seeing you evolving and I'm hoping that your audience also realizes that nothing is permanent. People feel stuck, a lot of people, but you're evolving, you're changing, you're, you're showing people it's possible. And that's the message that I want people to take away. Learning from the best. Yeah. Thank you, Luke. You always learn. Um, speechless, man. Like there's nothing I can say to you that you don't already know and that I've not already said to you. Just, uh, I'm blown away once again. That's what oh, that's thank about. you. It's a pleasure always. Thank, thank you, bro. You. That was the episode for today. If you're sticking around till this point, I don't know how I can possibly be more vulnerable on this podcast. Um, one of the motivations behind doing content in general is to make mistakes in my own life, is to go through pain, failure, rejection in my own life, figure out how to come out of it and then showcase the results of those experiments in the form of content just like this. I hope the podcast is helping you grow in whatever way. You don't have to consume every single episode. I know those of you who've consumed this episode entirely and have been moved by it are cut from the same cloth that I'm cut from. And I hope that my efforts, my team's efforts will always keep you as a firm supporter of the Renvi show. We need all the support in the world to keep this podcast going. I think of stopping this podcast so much, so often. But it's episodes like this that keep me refueled and keep me motivated to never stop this podcast, basically. Now, whether we stop it or we don't, um, this process has been therapeutic. I've been able to document my own journey, my own mind. Now, before this outro turns into a solo podcast, what I will say is we've linked some very intense solo podcasts down below as well. We've linked 
all of Luke's episodes down below. Make sure you check them out. We never intend to promote any form of drug addiction, but we do intend to promote scientific advancement. The world of neurology is changing very rapidly because the human race is learning more about the mind very rapidly. Support The Randy Show. Lots more neuroscience, neurology-based episodes coming your way. Lots more episodes that contain packets of healing just like this. Follow us on Spotify. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Only love, only healing, only peace for all the listeners. We'll see you soon.